Hello everyone and welcome back to another week with the Underwater Tribe. Monday, Monday, Monday. Monday, Monday it is. Uh... Ooh, I'm about to lose my microphone. Yes, there we because go. We, we disconnected the other day to do some voiceover. Some actual film. proper work. Yes. Come on, because this is fun. This is just this like... Is... This All is not work. Time. <laughs> this is chatting. Right. Not work, Luca. Huh? How Come is on. everyone, guys? If you're showing up, uh, please let us know in the comments uh, where you're watching from. And if you had a good weekend in many places in the world, uh, diving Still, is starting again. Yeah, actually, even here so in some places. We would like to know if some of you already did a first dive out there. That would be pretty cool and interesting to see, isn't it? I saw some people. Uh, what did I see some people? Diving all over the place, actually. In mm -hmm. California now as yep. well. Um, I saw some big happening in, uh, in Red Sea, yep. like lots of media coverage about the first dives being made again and all this uh, new normal sort of uh, protocols. Everybody's lucky. We are still, well, we're gonna, there are still, there's a couple of places now in Bali where you could actually go if you're kind of local. You can go. Yes. Up in uh, Pamutaran, if you are... Ah, that's true. That's you, true. you can go shore diving. You can't go to Menjangan, but you can go to Pamutaran. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, around the Japanese wreck now as well. That's but uh, not Panida, not, not Tulumben. Yet, not yet, but we're getting there. I we're think. getting there, hopefully slowly, soon. Slowly, slowly, we get Next there. Next month, I'm guessing. Can't wait to get in the water. Tourists, no. Diving, not tourists yes. yet, yes. Well, the latest is the news about Bali potentially opening back to tourism. When? When? Who knows? Who uh, knows? September, October? Yeah, they say maybe one of those. September, but uh, until something is official, we can't really like guarantee anything for no. sure yet. Right. And so it keeps changing, it's actually, because they'll say, okay, this, and then we'll do a travel bubble, and then they close the travel bubble and they do something else. So, yeah, correct. Well, All right, I say so the who best we got thing over is, there? Is we do it when we know. Hmm. Who do we have? We've got James. James we got Christopher. Uh, Christopher. I was just talking Karin. to Christopher. Karen. Good to see you there, Hello, guys. Karen. You're, you're awake early. Happy Monday. And do you know what day is today? It's Monday. And what, you know... It's, Every it's, day is some sort of world something or other it's day. It's world day of what? I saw something else. There was World Rainforest Day. That's today. But then there was something else I saw today as well. I don't know what it but was. But don't you think that actually is the best time to bring in our guests? Because during we're World talking Forest about Day? some orangutans. We're talking oh, about cars uh, there as well. Yeah. Hello from Ambon. Orangutans. Speaking of uh, rainforest. Rainforest oh, really. uh, protection safeguard. Wildlife uh, trading. Guys, today it's going to be pretty it's much a bit uh, like... This, I'm going to put now the parental thing on. Yes, Boom. parental. So it's going to be pretty parental, much parental advisory, explicit content. Not explicit um, not explicit lyrics, no. not explicit, but explicit photos. Yes, content. So like, uh, you remember like last time when we had Gatsy that we put that on <laughs> because we were using a little bit of colorful language. Colorful language. This time is going to be different uh, because we are going to actually show you some images that can be very uh, touchy and... Uh, can touch you deep uh, into Definitely. the feelings uh, and they are some, for some people out there hard to actually watch so if you would like to turn on just the podcast version of this uh, turn off your screen and just listen to the switch page the, keep the audio the dialogue on, stays on uh, on that speaking of if you didn't know if you and you're a podcaster You'd like listening to the podcast while you're doing the laundry or you're walking the dog or you're having a jog or whatever. These shows that we're doing, they're not just available here on YouTube and Facebook. You can actually listen to the audio only version on SoundCloud, on Apple Podcasts, and now also on, um, what's the other one? It's the one okay. I signed up for yesterday. I don't know. The <laughs> you signed up. Spotify. 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 We are on Spotify. So we're now, yeah. you search for Underwater Tribe yeah, on everywhere. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud. And you can hear us. You don't, you don't have to see our ugly faces. You can listen to us instead. Yeah. That's uh, actually is a nice way. I like to listen to podcasts in the morning. Do you? And do you know, like, we are becoming the, the Joe Rogan and Joe Rogan of Underwater I look a little bit more like <laughs> you Joe look than more you like, do. Like, like you than me. But That's we don't right. do the things that Joe does with the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the herbal. Yeah. And do you know, guys, we are also very close to another milestone over there on, we? on YouTube. We are just about yes. uh, 50 hours away from uh, the final 
The and final hurdle that we have to the hop over. The final hurdle to be eligible to actually monetize our YouTube, our channel. YouTube channel. So after you finish watching us today, play us 50 go over times. to YouTube and play it again <laughs> over there. Watch every episode over on YouTube yeah, yeah. and that'll put us over the edge. Correct. Right. And don't forget, we are not only YouTube, but we are also on Instagram and we are on Facebook here too, if you're watching. We're, we're selling all our social media today. It's yes, good. We are social. Hey, it's Monday. It's it is time Monday. To, to pitch the, all People, those out. You need to Talking about the coming goals up, for the week. The upcoming week. So yes. we're going to have Aaron Chukowski here today. And now, then who are we going to have on Wednesday? Wednesday, we've got Ethan Daniels and Lee Goldman of Coral Triangle Adventures. Pretty um, stories. Yeah, great stories, lots of nice photos. Uh, if you're ever, if you if you're not a diver and you like listening to our and watching our podcast and you're interested in snorkeling, uh, these guys can show you what you can see while you're snorkeling. Yeah. And then on Friday we've got Tobias Friedrich, who yes. is a German underwater photographer, full full, full, full time. time underwater photographer. That's Go, right. Gets, visits loads of cool places like Iceland, Greenland. He's the only person I know that's gone diving in Greenland. Mm -mm. Um, but obviously does a lot of the, the tropical things as well. It's got some great stories about a whale. Yeah, um, some behind the story. Yeah, some behind the scenes stories. Behind and then the we touch stories. on his latest, uh, his latest projects, which is some plugins for Lightroom, mm -hmm. which I have, which we will soon be doing a little show about. Digging these, these deeper plugins into as well. those. Yeah. So that's this week, yeah. Monday, today, five o'clock. We're going to do a little bit different for Wednesday. Wednesday is the morning slot. Wednesday will be the 8 a.m. slot. Mm -hmm. With Ethan and Lee because they're based in the U.S., so doing the the Wednesday uh, morning one, and then on Friday back to the 5 p.m. slot. Yeah. Now give a little introduction about Aaron. What is Aaron? A little doing? introduction about Aaron. Aaron, are you out there? Are you watching? I don't know. Maybe you should send him a message. See if he's actually Aaron? watching. Yeah, but Aaron is a, a a photojournalist, an investigative photojournalist, goes around the world, um, basically investigating. Crimes against wildlife. He does things mm -hmm. like um, well, what activities. you're going to see. So orangutans, snakes, dogs, um, yeah. otters, you tigers. All these. A lot of the times, like he did a big thing last year when we talked to him last time about otters and how people are keeping these wildlife as pets. And so he's kind of exposing these different yeah. things that are are not really wildlife that you should be keeping as a pet. There's a difference between a, mm -hmm. a dog and a cat and an otter. And yeah. keeping one of those in your home so um and in this you may recognize work. him as he, he used to be the host of the scuba zoo borneo from below indonesia from below timor from below so he, he's he's been in media a lot but now he's kind of gotten off the front of the camera side and he's now yeah. the exposing last few years more behind the camera sort, writing I mean, articles exposing or like exposing a, this like kind of telling stuff. you know exactly. like he goes there and he witnessed this and hard uh, work not only let's say the pets uh, and uh, or uh, wild animal use for instance uh, for uh, amusement mm. like in zoos and parks where they put uh, animals in uh, dreadful conditions exactly. living in dreadful conditions to, to then put up a show for uh, people buying a ticket and like going to watch tigers. As well as uh, some uh, medicine and uh, and thing, also like it's been now in the recent work that we're gonna talk today about, is actually been out uh, on wet markets. Yep, that is quite of uh, Cambodia. Um, yeah, it's quite of a topic uh, uh, of today. You know, sure like especially is. with the viruses going on around, it's been around in wet markets in Africa and Southeast Asia too. And it's not it's not easy. I mean, emotionally, this is not work that you that you take lightly. This is something that we're, especially I mean, most people that are, are, are watching out there will be fans of animals, will will be people that love animals. And for someone like Aaron to go out there and really expose this stuff and photograph this stuff and investigate this stuff, very difficult uh, emotionally as well yeah. as, as physically. Yeah. And then, yeah, spoiler alert, you will see actually during this interview that uh, he looks a few tough uh, images. Uh, you know, so he looks broken. He looks, he looks, by, he looks a little his. broken. Yeah. And then uh, one last thing before we launch the interview, guys, uh, is also like a very important site that we covered during this interview. And uh, I think it's worth mentioning it now before the interview and also after the interview is uh, this uh, site called uh, bornfree.org.uk where there is a section which is called uh, 
raise the red flag and basically that if you are somewhere out there and you're witnessing some wildlife uh, uh, abuse uh, you can actually report that uh, by using the site that we placed in the description of yes. this live show but without any further ado well, let's go straight hello cassandra we haven't seen you in hours the interview Welcome back to the show, Mr. Aaron Bertie Jakowski. See, I got your name much better this time than the last time. You did. Well done, Mike. You Cheers, see, Mike. I've been practicing. Good to see you, Aaron. Good to see you guys. How you doing? Good. A little different than the last time you were on our show. We were here in the studio. Well, we're still in the studio. You look somewhere exotic and, and greenish there. And, and, and skinny, because I'm... Uh... Uh, it's been a rough few weeks recovering from pneumonia, and also you fuckers have made me get up at the crack of dawn to do this. Crack of dawn, it's 10 o'clock. <laughs> it's 10, 10 o'clock. Yeah. Just like a disclaimer, we were all thinking that you were having COVID 19, but at the end, like you did not have actually COVID 19. You just had pneumonia during an epidemic of COVID 19. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been great fun in Bali, like jumping from COVID clinic to COVID clinic and skipping the virus and actually just going straight to the uh just going straight to the pneumonia straight to the good stuff yeah. nice i could use a, a little weight a weight loss program like you had it's actually some people yes. might be jealous yeah, yeah, yeah. well maybe if we had a little a little cheeky kiss then you could have some pneumonia <laughs> from me no that's all right <laughs> thanks thanks okay and uh, here I think like we need to come out with a little bit of a disclaimer before we jump straight into this. This is not the usual show, guys, that we're going to bring you on the show. Uh, the usual, uh, you know, we nice, don't have any positive, pretty fish, pretty fish uh, and beautiful dive stories. This is going to be hardcore, right? This is what uh, Aaron does, uh, does hardcore job, is uh, a frontliner out there to... Uh, uh, help raise awareness uh, on the um, wildlife uh, animal trading, you know? Yep, illegal so, pet trading as well as just pet. illegal, illegal uh, yeah. poaching of, it's of kind different of animals. Human animal, human animal conflict is, is how I kind of bracket what I do mainly. Used to be all the nice fun dive stuff and now it's, um, it's migrated. Well, actually, I've always done human animal conflict. And then I went into the nice fun dive stuff. And now I've just gone back to uh, to what I used to do more of, which is more what uh, drives me or fires my soul. Right. Yes. Oh, it's a very passionate subject. And I think the last time uh, I'm going to say it was a little bit less than a year ago or so when you were here uh, in studio with us. And after that, you were going on on a big world tour. You were going to go to a bunch of different places and doing a bunch of different new projects. Um, what have you been up to? Oh, man. Um, it, it was a, it's been a crazy year. Um, I spent about probably eight months on the road. Um, I've been making a film about orangutan tourism. That's a, a feature documentary that's spent three years working on that a passion project that's in the final stages of edit did a tour of europe of cruel wildlife tourism operators um with an ngo four paws to show that actually cruel wildlife tourism isn't exclusive to asia in fact it's all over the world um i did a job about dog eating in cambodia which was brutal that was pretty horrific uh, i've made a film about pythons and the exotic pet trade through world animal protection I uh, went to voodoo markets in uh, West Africa um, to do a piece about voodoo. That was actually part of our Python story. So, yeah, I spent um, months going job to job to job, um, which is probably why I'm sitting here recovering from pneumonia now. Right. I just uh, pushed myself a little bit too hard and, and, and broke myself. Um, so, yeah, a lot has changed in the last year since, since we spoke. Um, but I've had some pretty crazy adventures, worked on some really interesting jobs. And, and you know, maybe I can hopefully I can show you guys some of the pics that yeah. have um, produced yeah. over the past year. And uh, before we jump right into that, uh, for the people that uh, might have uh, difficulties watching some animal uh, uh, 
cruelty cruelty images uh, guys uh, maybe turn on the image and just listen it as a podcast <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah. there, there may be some people out there that would do better on the audio only version of this audio, one, audio rather, only version. rather than seeing the yes. images because yeah, yeah. they I are like not they w- <laughs> would you, yeah. you didn't pull any punches on these ones yeah unless pictures of dead dogs floating in a bucket of blood uh, does it for you then you might want to look elsewhere even yes. my family won't look at my pictures most of the time yeah. you see i think that they have a certain beauty to them i think they, they they have this macabre haunting um aesthetic quality um but a lot of my friends and family don't agree and they're just like just just don't show me anything yeah i think anything. haunting would be a good word for it for sure yeah and yeah. actually also yeah, the way you portray I mean, I want... that those we were already speaking during the podcast uh, w- which we made with you and for the people that haven't watched the podcast you can refer to our youtube page like the way that you actually portray them it also adds on uh, this more uh, dark uh, side of uh, this industry this horrible industry you know so you portray it very well thank thank you i want to throw the subject, to, I want them to throw them into the center of frame. And I want people not just to see the animal, but to actually be the animal. Um, and that's kind of the goal of my photography. I want it to be very visceral, very immersive. I want people to feel something when they look at my photos. Yep, they definitely, they certainly draw immediate yes. emotion. You, you know, you, you go down the Facebook page and all of a sudden it's like, whoa. So you, you've definitely got yeah. that part of it, mm-hmm. for sure. Okay, well, that's, well, that's good. And then I'm doing something right. Yep. Yeah. Well, why don't we start uh, looking at some of these and you can tell a little bit of the story behind uh, what we're, is that the top one there? Looks like we are starting here in West Africa with the voodoo. Yes, there is like a table with lots of uh, dried, Lo- mummified animals. Yeah, yeah. This was one of my favorite images over the past year. Um, in in West Africa, it's the it's the home of voodoo, where voodoo is actually a recognized religion, uh, and they've been using voodoo's been around for it predates religion. So we're talking thousands and thousands of years. People have been using animal parts, um, and it, you know it could be for superstitions, it could be for healing. This, these animal parts are used for so many different purposes. Um, and as you'll see on that table, you've got every species imaginable. You know, you've got hawksbill turtle, you've got civets, you've got baboons, you've got, I mean, it, it, it's really wild the amount of species that are used in this practice. Lip parts. Um, no one knows. It's very hard to quantify the impact that uh, voodoo is having on wild animal populations. Um, but based on what we saw, uh, it's, it's going to be quite substantial. Um, so this was uh, as part of the film that we were working on about pythons and the exotic pet trade, um, trying to see if we could find any python heads there as well to see whether they were used in voodoo too. Uh, so it was a little kind of side story uh, to mm-hmm. the film that we've been working on uh, yeah, about, about pythons, which we'll come on to soon. When, uh, when you were taking these images, did you take it, let's say, to a local market? or? Yeah, this was a local market in Benin. And it was, it's hard to describe what this market was like. It was, if there is hell on, on this earth, the, that's this market. It was, you know, waist high rubbish. It was, we saw women rolling around on the floor, fighting each other and pulling each other's hair out. It was people just fires everywhere. People just smashing stones, just filth and poverty. And it was, it was like something from Mad Max. Yeah. Um, and it was it was somewhere we actually felt very very unsafe. You know, we're certainly the only Westerners there. It was not a tourist destination whatsoever. And this st- place was at a you know at a rooftop in the market. So you battle your way through this uh, apocalyptic hellhole, and then you get to this market where the traders really don't want you there. Mm. Uh, but we managed to sweet talk them and and get a few photos. Um, mm. But it's certainly not a place that I will want. I would want to revisit ever again. Okay, so that's a very interesting insight. So to actually, so this is not something that you would see down on the normal road uh, with a lady behind uh, a table selling uh, these sort of things. So you have to make your way through 
in the backs of the market, you said on top of a roof. And so they yep. know that this is illegal stuff happening. Yeah, uh, it's not actually illegal. What they're doing isn't illegal. So why they don't um, put it just on display for everyone? Uh, it kind of it, it is on display for everyone. It's just kind of hidden away in, a, in this huge sprawling market. Um, so, so actually, so that's why you have to be quite sensitive when covering stories like this, because if, like I said, this has been going on for thousands of years. So to suddenly come there as a Westerner and be like, you shouldn't be doing this, this is, this is wrong, is, is I think not necessarily um, the right thing to do. Uh, but of course, as the, as the conservationist, you're very worried about the impact that it's having on wild populations. Uh, but that's the job, that's my job anyway, is just to kind of document what you see and try not cast too many aspersions and to then let the viewer make up their own minds. Mm -hmm. But if you just go in there kind of wagging, wagging fingers and being judgmental, then you're not going to get very far. Were you with a local team that, that sort of organized you to get in there? You didn't just walk in, just the, you and your cameraman. You had a, a local uh, uh -huh. fixer with you? Yeah, we had a fixer and he was fantastic and he managed to uh, organize for us to, to take some shots. Yeah, but without him, there's no way we could have done it. Right. Crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were mentioning about you, you were over there to, to film about the, the Python uh, trading film. And then oh, that's the... right. <clears throat> Sorry, carry on, Luca. Yeah, maybe we can jump into this. Did, did you find any Python? Some there? images in there. We did. We found some, we found some Python heads that were being used in, um, in Voodoo. We don't know where the Pythons were coming from or what the usage is, but we did find a bucket of python heads and then we started to attract a lot of attention so we got out of there very quickly i managed to get a few shots nothing nothing too exciting right um so the film is about pythons and, and the exotic pet trade and um pythons are one of the most popular animals used worldwide um uh, particularly bull pythons um I, you know there's nearly a million bull pythons in captivity in america alone oh. um but um, so the, the, the film was for World Animal Protection, uh, and it raises some issues about, uh, first of all, where are all the pythons coming from? And then if they're being exported, because they're endemic to West Africa. So if they're being exported, how are they being collected from the wild and then, and then exported? Um, if they're being bred in America, um, what are some of the issues surrounding that? What are some of the animal welfare concerns? So we traveled across three continents looking at this story. So the U.S., Africa, and what's the third, Asia? Or? Um, we were in the uh, Czech Republic where we met an exotic pet vet, and okay. he showed us some of the uh, animal welfare concerns. And this film has already come out, yes? Or just the promotional part yeah. of it? Yeah, it's come out. It's on, it's on YouTube. It's called Suffering in Silence. Okay, we placed the link in the description here so that people okay. can go and... and... The interesting thing about that is that I know you got a lot of kickback on that. I guess both positive and negative, but you, you ended up getting quite a bit of negative, um, not negative yeah. press, but negative kickback from people who have these as pets. Let's just say that the film ruffled some feathers and I had a lot of people from the reptile trade getting in touch. And I mean, they were, they were quite brutal. Uh, they were, pretty insulting um you know threatening as well um they clearly didn't like their industry industry being criticized because they're not used to it mm. so there haven't really been any films or any credible films that have come out about pythons in captivity um of course because the film was shot for an ngo it is um the the bias is is there from the start i mean it's quite clear that this ngo are, are anti pythons in captivity um we are working on a longer version a broadcast version that's going to be a little bit more um kind of cinematic and less of an ngo film so i can see some of their concerns i can see some of the reptile owners um issues with the film um but i, I can't condone how people behaved and their responses towards it you know if you want to have um debate about it then i'm i'm open to that and let's have a positive chat about it and see how we could improve 
or see how we could make the film a little bit more balanced. I did have some positive discussions with reptile owners um, and their considerations that we'll take into account for, for the next film. Um, but I also think that they, the fact is, yeah, we did uh, rattle some cages and we did raise some very relevant points about the industry and about how the animals are kept in the expos and these like tiny Tupperware boxes, which would be very stressful for them about how people don't know how to take care of uh, their snakes properly. And, you know, a lot of the snakes get burns from improper care or they, I, and a lot, I mean, you also have to consider people will, will, would say to me, they're like, well, my snake in captivity lives a lot longer. It can live to 30, 40 years. A snake in the wild has predators or it will normally um, die much younger. It's like, well, does 30 or 40 years in captivity in a tub in someone's house, is that necessarily the sort of life that you would, you mm. would want to live? Right. Yeah. And just, just because they live longer, it doesn't yeah. necessarily make it right. Stuck at home. Just like what we're doing now. Like we're doing now. Yeah, just like we are. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's, it was an interesting story. Um, it's, it's, it was quite hard as filmmakers because people don't necessarily have that empathy for snakes. They're not cute and cuddly. They don't right. come and give you a, you know, a little kiss or a kiss on the cheek. Um, so that was a challenge for us. Well, did it, was it hard to get um, cooperation from people like pet owners in the States to work with you or...? Very hard, very hard. Uh, we tried so many different breeders and owners and they wouldn't speak to us. Um, but we did go to an expo and we filmed there. Um, and then, so we spoke to exotic pet owners at the expo. Um, for the next film, I would really like to go, we want to go back to America and to actually go and meet some of the breeders and to, to get their side of the argument, which is not going to be easy at the moment. Right. That's how things start. What's the plan? We're supposed to be in America now. And I think, I don't know if it's the actual ball python itself, but in places like the Everglades in Florida, there is now an infestation of imported uh, pythons, and I guess it's also yeah. Asian, Asian pythons, yeah. that are threatening, threatening a lot of the local indigenous population of, of animals yeah. there. So if you go to that photo of um, a guy holding a bag, holding that was actually bag, taken yeah. in the Everglades. Yeah. That's a in guy the in the Everglades. Yeah, so it's the it's a it's the Burmese python, and it's thought that the Burmese python became invasive there. Um, either they, they escaped from a, a ranch um, because of a natural disaster, and the other theory is that people they're exotic pets that people no longer want to care for, so they just release them into the Everglades. And as you said, they've become invasive there now, and they've wiped out all small mammal populations. So the state is incentivizing people to go out and catch them. Um, so they have these python hunting competitions and they, there's gentlemen like this guy called Dusty Crumb, who is a local who goes out and he catches pythons and then they kill them and they, uh, they get money from the state and they also use the uh, meat for bait. They turn the skin into wallets and handbags and that sort of thing. So we went out uh, python hunting with Dusty Crumb to document the work that he's doing. And that is a shot of him at the end of a very hard night's work with a, a small python in his bag. Mm -hmm. And then we have Very another cool shot. shot of him of holding a snake in a, in a river or something. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that was when he went and um, caught a snake from, from one of the swamps. Um, so this is, he's a, he's a fascinating guy, uh, kind of a hillbilly type character, um, actually very smart. But he has his own show on Discovery, Discovery uh, Channel. You, look, I wanted to tell you, he has a very good Discovery Channel look. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is. Yeah, he is Discovery Channel. He, he's got his own show there, yeah. Python Hunting Show. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he, he went out and he caught one in a swamp and you know, took it out and killed it. What about the ball pythons that you're talking about before, uh, coming from Africa? Are they an endangered species in Africa now with, uh, with the pet trade, or are they still a, a well-established population? Uh, it's, it's, ball pythons are generally of least concern, um, so they're not necessarily endangered. Uh, it's, it's quite hard to know. Uh, they live in burrows, so it's very hard to get um, accurate population estimates. Um, but now they're not even, um, because 
they're so easily bred and they're bred particularly within America and people like to create different color morphs. So a python, ball python becomes more valuable if it's an interesting or, or beautiful color morph. Interesting. Um, so the, actually the standard ball pythons don't have that much value anymore. So there's the export level. The export levels have just gone like that and they're not even meeting their quotas anymore. Mm -hmm. It's good for the natural population, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then you said that uh, many, there are many breeders out there. So maybe they try to breed them with special albino look uh, and this. Uh, they do. They do. Yeah. And you can get huge amounts of money. I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars for different morphs. Wow. Uh, so they even, you know, bred scaleless pythons, which, uh, which again, you're playing God. It's incredibly cool. And all, the amount of animals that die, the amount of snakes that die or are born with defects because of these experiments. Right. Uh, and also we can own something exotic and cool. Mm -hmm. And the one thing before you were mentioning that uh, some of the owners, uh, they say, well, in my house can live up to 30 years of age. How big does a python become you know if he's 30 years old a bull python they only grow to about five feet max oh that's uh, burmese python grow much bigger burmese pythons meters they, they're, they're huge um but the bull pythons the reason that they're so popular is they don't grow that big they're quite docile they do well in captivity um which has contributed to them being the most okay. popular reptile on, on the exotic pet trade Okay. Sorry, before uh, I think uh, there was a bit of a glitch with the connection. Uh, how big does the Burmese python grow? They they can grow meters, like five six meters, I think. Yeah, yeah. there was Maybe one uh, close uh, to Here Lembe. In yeah, yeah in, in in a zoo and it was like in a box, uh, and basically like. Uh, they were saying that it's about uh, 10 meters or something like that. And the head was, some, yeah, yeah the, 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 the head was like that, like this, why like, like it looked like an anaconda, but was a python, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I've certainly heard of, of, uh, in Borneo of seven meter specimens, but I yeah. don't know. They got, I didn't yeah. know they got, yeah, that. the biggest, uh, the biggest python on record has come from Sulawesi. Hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah, I wouldn't want to mess with. It. These are the ones, you know, every now and again, a farmer disappears and they, they find uh, in the yeah. belly of a python. Yeah. That happens. Yeah, they'll take a, a smaller person. They take children. They can take old, older ladies. Yep. Someone got killed last year, an old lady, and cut yeah, okay. out of the belly of yeah. a python. Yep. Exactly. And uh, in, in, in Cambodia, I think it's in Cambodia or like s somewhere around there, that uh, there were like a few uh, Facebook viral videos that they, they're going around where you have the, like this bunch of uh, kids that uh, they basically go to look for pythons and you see them like handling huge pythons with uh, great yeah. skills. Uh, have you seen those? Uh, I haven't. I haven't seen it. No, yeah. but um, I can imagine. You know, especially if you're brought up, brought up around nature, you know how to handle wildlife and how to mm. behave around it. So they would go out on their ice fields, and they are like a snake catcher, and uh, they basically like a, yeah. they dig a hole, and all of a sudden there is like a snake in there. They know exactly where the snake lives, and uh, they start to pull it out, and the snakes start to wrap around the feet of the, the one of the kids. The other kids just go there calmly and doing it, and by the by after five minutes, they are just putting the snake on their back and they're walking out with the snake. <laughs> yeah, they're generally pretty docile pythons. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the, the guys that we filmed in West Africa, they had this black powder and they would smell this black powder when they were around snake burrows and it would lead them to where the snakes were, were hiding. Oh, it was quite fascinating. Interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting, yes. And probably also like maybe now speculating but probably these kids are also maybe going to collect this for skins uh, and meat, and meat. Uh, yeah, exactly. to eat yeah. Uh, and, yeah a lot of meat on a python yeah, yeah it's, it's a fairly common um in, in many parts of the world snake is actually quite commonly eaten mm -hmm. yeah i wouldn't want to eat it apparently it's not yeah. good but uh yeah a lot of meat on a python tastes like chicken uh, yeah. at least that's what they say and this is quite of uh, now a, um, let's say, um, um, 
subject that we're discussing right now, you know, mm. like where this uh, virus came out from, came from, they say, from these wet markets uh, or like these places where there is lots of uh, wildlife uh, trade, trade mm -hmm. and animals have been uh, sold as meat uh, and, and so on. So, yeah, we, I think we start to move on into some of the uh, hardcore uh, Shall we go to part of this shall show? Shall we go to Cambodia? And we go to Cambodia. I think we should finish with the orangutans on a happy uh, on a, a happy cute, note. Not yeah. a happy note, but a cuter note. Let's go to let's go to Cambodia. And how did that all whole, right. so, uh, whole thing come up? I got so this was this was actually at the end of my what what's the first picture, Luca? I start with the easy easier uh, images with the animals in the cage, all the dogs uh, together by the car okay. in the back of a in, pickup. Yeah, yeah, in the back of the car. So this was actually at the end of my world tour and I, I came to Bali and I got a house, rented a house and I just settled into my house and I was just broken. I was like, I'm not doing any jobs now for a couple of months. I need a rest. And then I got a call from a client like dog eating Cambodia come next week. <laughs> oh. and, um, so I had to think sort of long and hard about it, but, but it was a story I'd wanted to cover for years. Uh, and it seemed like uh, too good an opportunity um, to pass up. Too good an opportunity, and maybe that's not put in the right way. But um, I knew it's just such a fascinating story, and I knew that the images would be so widely seen. And I thought that I could actually go into Cambodia and, and actually make a difference in terms of trying to get the trade stopped. So I decided to take the assignment on. Um, every year, three million dogs plus are killed in Cambodia uh, and eaten. Yet people don't really know about it. Everyone thinks about Vietnam and China when it comes to uh, eating dogs. But actually in Cambodia, there's this trade that has just kind of gone unnoticed. Um, and what makes it unique is the way that the dogs are killed. They're often killed in drowning pits. Um, so they put the dogs in cages and then they um, literally lower them into a putrid pit of water and, and kill them. Yeah, I'm showing uh, here the image uh, where there are two, there is a cage with dogs uh, beside this pit. Yeah, yeah. this was um, this was one of the most macabre. I mean, this scene actually made the voodoo markets look like Disneyland. Um, this was a place where they killed hundreds of dogs every single day and they would, yeah, just the dogs would be rounded up from all over Cambodia and they would be put in cages and then um, rounded up and then slaughtered. Um, and this guy had been doing it for, I think, 15 years. I think we worked out that he'd killed over 20,000 dogs in that house. Uh, and it was like a scene from a horror movie, you know? It's co cobwebs and filth and blood and this just black, bubbling water that the dogs are killed in. And then, kind of worst of all, there was a chained up macaque. Uh, it's the guy's pet with skin and bones. And this macaque just sits at the top of the drowning pit and has witnessed all of these dogs being killed in the most horrific way imaginable. Yeah. yeah. Um, you can, you can make this shit up. Like it, it yeah. would be the, the most ideal setting for a horror movie. Mm -hmm. Um, I never saw the dogs being killed. Um, but mm -hmm. you can imagine it. Uh, this was, uh, yeah, it was a, it was a pretty, it was a very dark assignment, and it sent me into a, into a deep, deafening hole of sadness for yeah, a long time for after. Sure. Still, some, still, sometimes when I go to sleep, I see these images of these dogs stuffed in cages, just awaiting, awaiting their fate. Um, so, yeah, it was. Um, I just kind of sat there in the back of, we got driven around all these slaughterhouses in Cambodia. And I just sat there with my headphones on listening to London grammar, which is the saddest music possible. Just there with my head against a window, like just feeling utterly bleak and depressed about humanity for a long time. Um, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't have taken it on. I'm not sure at that time um, I was in the right state of mind to do it. Um, but anyway, the story went big. Uh, and it was in all over the British press. Um, and then it was, they, they just had meetings with the Cambodian government recently and they sh they seen all the negative press and they promised to do something about it. So they've gone and they've started investigating. So that's really 
Well, that's what you can hope for as a, mm. as a photojournalist is to make people aware of these issues and then um, to try and end suffering because ultimately it's, it's not just millions of dogs that are suffering, it's a public health issue. Uh, and if people knew that they were eating rabid dog meat, um, well, I think they wouldn't, right. they just wouldn't do it. There's this misconception that dog meat is good for circulation, it's good for health yeah. issues, and even doctors in Cambodia are prescribing it for <laughs> health problems. Um, so we need to get that stopped, and um, and and the cruelty. Yeah. A lot of people will say, "Well, what's the difference between eating a dog and eating a chicken?" Um, and in, in some senses, that's right. I'm not saying that chickens don't suffer; like they're kept in horrific conditions at some of these these farms. Um, but dogs, it's um, first of all the, the the intelligence and the sentience of a dog. Uh, it's the way that they're rounded up. Um, and you know, smashed over the head, and then they're stuck in these cages, and a lot of them die on the way to slaughterhouses of stress and dehydration. It's the killing methods that are used. I mean, imagine being in a crate and then seeing dog after dog being killed, and then you know your turn is next. Um, and then it's the uh, it's the health concerns as well. So, uh, yeah, interesting interesting story, uh, graphic imagery. Yes. Um, I don't, you can see the shot of the, uh, we also went to the restaurants and we saw them preparing dog meat. I think there should be a shot there. Yeah. Yeah. It's in a bag. In a plastic bag. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's the dog waiting to be, um, they will Further scrape down. off all the fur. They scrape off all the fur and then they chop it up. And can you see the picture of the dog in the bucket of blood? Yeah. Yes. We're going to go on that one very there quickly. There we go. I was really going to show gonna move this, that man. One. <laughs> I was really sorry. You know, you were giving that great explanation. Now I brought it up and I say, okay, yeah. that's it. Yeah. You know, Aaron, I think, you know, one thing is... Three down, I think is like, that one. Yeah. This one is the one oh, no, on the back. Oh, okay. But let's stay with this one here, which yeah, is a little still bit, cruel. A little, but like little bit easier on the eyes. You know, Aaron, yeah, you, said, you, you brought up like a very important point. What's the difference? Uh, uh, well, you know, like, you know, it's different a dog or a chicken, but I, I don't know if it's, it really is, you know, the difference between, let's say, uh, dog meat of chicken meat or something like that. So or like you said, the dog's intelligent, maybe the chicken is not. Maybe we just don't underst understand the chicken. You, you see what I mean? When I'm trying yeah. to go with that. Yes. Yeah. And like when... That's a good point. Now more and more we we see these uh, images, for instance, of uh, cows and how they react, and, and like pigs. Pigs can be like uh, pigs, a, yeah. as good pet and intelligent as dogs. So when when you do this, uh, you you raise you raise our awareness because this is the pet I have. You know. Now you bring mm -hmm. in this up. Exactly. So that's, that's why that's why people react so strongly to it because everyone well you know millions of people worldwide have dogs as pets and then suddenly you see this story and that's why it prompts such a um strong reaction and a lot of people but you, also you could say that the dogs a lot of the time they're they're caught and killed within a single day uh, or within a couple of days a pig or a chicken or a cow goes through a lifetime of suffering and then they're killed uh you know some of the time the dogs can have a good life they just have one bad day um <laughs> but uh i shouldn't i shouldn't say that but, yeah, well, uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it makes it's, sense like cattles that yeah. they they've been they born into that environment and uh, they yeah. live all their life the in life a cage that they cannot move you know and so these are mostly absolutely. wild dogs stray so, dogs that are on the road that they're just catching stray dogs but they are so, obviously people's pets um yeah, so, so they'll them. just round up whatever dogs, whatever dogs they can find. A lot of the time, the dogs are traded for pots and pans. So you have guys going along on mopeds, and they'll have loads of pots and pans on the back of the moped with a big cage. And then they'll, you know, they'll trade a dog for a pot. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they stick the dogs in this cage and on the back of their moped. Yeah. And in here in, um, in Asia, they also, um, sometimes they steal them from households. You know, like they just exactly. go by the gates and uh, they have like a loop and in, out, and your pet is gone. Can, can you imagine the anguish or the 
mental turmoil if you knew that your dog your best friend the love of your life had been put in a cage and, and was about to be drowned and then eaten mm. yeah, I, yeah. That, just and and here is the point, you know, like we, we need to, let's say, understand we need to feed ourselves, you know, like, and we say, oh, yeah, you can go plant based. I agree on that. We don't understand plants. Maybe they're over there suffering too when we are eating them, you know. So, <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, it's more obvious on animals for sure. So, but let's say that now uh, let's put uh, the meat eating things as, a, let's say, something that uh, we need to survive. But it's the cruelty mm -hmm. behind that you're rising. Yeah. So whether you are in a slaughterhouse yeah. uh, in uh, Europe uh, or North America, and whether you are in uh, Asia on a wet market like that, uh, why mm -hmm. should it be mm -hmm. there that cruelty in uh, rising and killing an animal, you know? Yeah, I think cruelty of any sorts and unnes unnecessary <laughs> suffering is what we want to avoid. Um, but but people have different, very different views towards animal welfare and animal sentience <laughs> around the world. It's not like we are in the West where we appreciate that animals suffer and they have feelings and animals will get scared and depressed. Here in in in, in Africa, it's 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 protein, um, and it's it doesn't kind of register that these are beings that could um, that could suffer. Right. Uh, so we, we have to be culturally sensitive too. And there are, we were just brought up in one way and other people were brought up in a, in a different way. Uh, so again, it's like, you know, through the stories, I, they're, they're always going to be a bit sensationalized, these stories, because that's mm. unfortunately what, yeah. what fell. But at but, this, but at, at this to, stage, I don't, so, sorry yeah. to interrupt you here, but, uh, you know, it like, depends how people get brought up. But okay, but we do understand that there are some study behind that that we can see that animals uh, now have feelings and animals have that. So like we could, at this stage, I think we could all get together with the information that is widespread and it's easy to deliver to any uh, place in the world. We could come there and come out more with this animal uh, rights uh, and yeah. say that it's illegal to be cruel towards an animal. Yes. Um and, and now, because of coronavirus, there is much more talk of it. Uh, so there has been a, a shift in people's perceptions towards animals, which is good. How long it will last, I don't know. There's lots of people saying this is going to be a really good thing for animals. In, in another sense, it could be a really bad thing, because when people get back to their daily lives and, and everyone is facing very hard times, then actually it could be the animals that end up suffering. Um, so yeah, it's great to see that the, the, there are changes. There's changes been happening in China and in Vietnam concerning animal welfare laws. Um, but how long it lasts for, I don't know. Is it enough? No. Um, but a, a pandemic like this, like we're currently facing, I know we don't want to go down the coronavirus route too much, but we can't have a, a chat like this without mentioning coronavirus and animal mm -hmm. welfare. Um, is that uh, you know pandemic has been long overdue and if you go to some of these markets and you see some of the conditions it's amazing that something like this hasn't happened earlier all it takes is for a pangolin to catch a virus from a bat and then a guy to slaughter a pangolin and get some blood in a cut or in his eye boom and then you know the whole entire planet is in lockdown and you have hundreds of thousands of people <coughs> being killed yeah. um, so it's pretty amazing that this ha doesn't didn't happen earlier let's mm. just hope that this current mess is used as a, as a, a learning catalyst. point yeah. Yeah. and uh, yeah and so in Sulawesi for instance there are quite few uh, markets like that and uh, uh, imagine that uh, you could even you can still go let's say for uh, a day tour you know when uh, our guests were coming mm. on, uh, Manado. on Manado like uh, they come diving for a week the day they cannot go diving what do you want to do I want to go for a tour and yeah. one of the tour was actually going to visit the local market uh, up in the mountains and you would have yeah. like uh, bats bats python uh, yeah. rats uh, dogs, dogs uh, like that and and like you said all like Say, say it again yeah all piled up yeah all, yeah. Mi all mixed together everything yeah. just kind yeah. of in one yeah. big 
and the butcher is there and he does the job uh, in front of you so actually i had a few people i always warn mm -hmm. them that i say like guys it's not it's not gonna be an easy view like this oh yeah yeah i can do it no it's not gonna be easy so i had a few pictures that i could show them that have been there because i didn't want to go back to that place uh, anymore where no. you could see the bats uh, with the without the wings and cut like that and then they would understand no. some of them still wanted to go there but then that's the image what you're describing now is actually the conditions that it comes also like smell you know it, it really fills you up on the senses you understand that it's really a yeah a very unsanitized environment yeah and bats in particular are reservoirs for disease um bats harbor about 145 different diseases um so that's where a lot of these um novel pathogens are coming from and many of them can in infect humans uh, i think in fact uh 75 of all new diseases come from animals yeah. um so so yeah we do look at Ebola, SARS, uh, HIV from chimpanzees, uh, COVID-19, these are all zoonotic diseases. Uh, so we have to do what we can to, to minimize this happening again, because all it would take is for this to be a little, uh, don't get me wrong, this is a horrific illness, um, but if it was a little bit more potent, we could be talking, instead of hundreds of thousands or a million or two dead, we could be talking half the planet. Yep. Um, so, so I think we need to do something particularly in southeast asia we need to do something to to minimize these markets did you guys were you filming as well was there more was it just you uh, with a local team or was it where you guys have a film team as well uh where at in particular the, the cambodia in cambodia uh we um we I was with the associated french associated press in France, they were there and was with an NGO called Four Paws. So Four Paws are the guys to check out if, if you want to learn more information about the, the dog meat trade in Cambodia. Okay. So there's no, there's no upcoming film. It was strictly a, a photo, photojournalism. It was strictly photojournalism. Yeah. I wish we'd uh, filmed it as well. Um, I, I don't know who our audience would be because that's, that's, that would be a pretty brutal watch. Right. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, we didn't film it. It was just a photography project. Gotcha. Shall we move on to a... Yeah, let's move on to... A, or Still a little bit distressing looking photos, but much less distressing photos. Yeah. And this is something that you said you have um, been working on for a long time, is your orangutan project. Yeah, uh, three years now I've been working on a documentary about orangutan tourism um, for Raise the Red Flag, uh, which is a project that looks at the wildlife tourism industry globally and tries to raise awareness about some of the issues facing animals in captivity, a project that I've done in collaboration with uh, Born Free Foundation. Um, so as part of the project, um, myself and the, and the crew um, have that it don donated our time and expertise for, for three years now with no pay and, and a lot of uh, blood, sweat and tears. And we have gone and documented um, orangutans in captivity. So from the boxing orangutans of Thailand uh, to, animal, to orangutans in, in Vietnam, um, Indonesia, Malaysia, we, we've, we've seen them all over the place. Um, and what makes this such a interesting and sort of heartbreaking project is that orangutans uh, they share ninety seven percent DNA with humans. Um, they are intelligent in ways that that we don't even understand. Um, so they really suffer in captivity, uh, and they will be kept. So uh, in Thailand, they're made to box each other um they will be kept in tiny cages with zero stimulation orangutans are so intelligent they need to be constantly stimulated they will be kept with other orangutans whereas in the wild they're generally very solitary uh, and they're, they're constantly exposed to people and to tourists and these animals are very shy if you see them in the wild they will go in the opposite direction they certainly don't crave human company um so yeah it's it, it's been a a fascinating journey and we've looked at not just uh orangutans in captivity but also the trade so how did they actually end up there uh, so for example in thailand they um 
confiscated 105 of the orangutans at Safari World at the boxing shows because DNA testing showed that the orangutans weren't bred there like they claimed, but they were actually got illegally from Indonesia or Malaysia. So the authorities confiscated them. Uh, within a couple of years, Safari World managed to get hold of more and the boxing shows continued and they're still going on to this day. Uh, and then you have this whole problem of what to do with the animals. Right. So what do you do with a hundred orangutans? So then they, these, are, these animals ended up with the Thai authorities for years. And can you imagine what state they're kept in there? <laughs> and then eventually they're sent back to Indonesia. Um, but then where do you put them? Uh, so a lot of these poor orangutans are still in cages at um, BOS Foundation. And these guys are just amazing. They're doing such good work for orangutan conservation. But they have a problem. They don't have enough space to put these orangutans uh, in the wild and you can't just take animals that have spent their lives in captivity and then release them they have to go through an entire program and rehabilitation scheme in order to release them back in, into the jungle and many of them will never be released at all because they wouldn't survive right but you have this heartbreaking situation where you just have row upon row of xboxing orangutans just you know looking it was it was the most distressing place i think i've ever been and these animals were just dead. They were gone behind the eyes. Um, but then there were a few success stories. Uh, so BOS have got these uh, pre-release islands where the animals are released uh, into these uh, semi-wild habitats. Uh, and if you can see the shot of the mother and baby. Yeah. Yep. So that's uh, Suja and Bella. And Suja is an ex-boxing orangutan and she gave birth to little Bella and they have now been released uh, into the jungles. So oh, that wow. was one, yeah, that was that was one good story. Um, <clears throat> and, and this it is actually- It feels so good, man. Like, yeah. like now we've been talking about 45 minutes and this that you just said, it feels so good, man. <laughs> yes, yeah, a bit of light relief. Um, and it, it, it shows, and what BOS have shown that there, there is, potential for responsible orangutan tourism so this shot was taken from a boat and then these orangutans will have this you know big area this big pre-release island and then they come down to the edge of the jetty uh, where people you where the people will feed them fruit not tourists the, the handlers will feed them every day and then tourists can observe them on a boat from a distance where you're not impacting on the animals at all and actually they have a really nice life there but People will often say to me, well, where can you have responsible orangutan counters? And that, that, there's really almost nowhere. There's very, very few places where you can go and actually not be impacting on the animals. Um, and even at places like Bukit Luang in Sumatra, that's supposed to be this ecotourism destination, actually you have a situation where all the guides are feeding the orangutans, orangutans are attacking tourists and guides, and it's an absolute mess. Um, so it's really, uh, that's, that's another place that we filmed for the documentary. So it's a really um, <clears throat> complex issue. And then we also looked at... Let's get back a moment to, let's say, the example you gave to Bukit Lawan. That's actually is a natural environment, Aaron. So it's, it's easier to change something in there. So it's the behavior maybe of the guide that they do the force feeding to uh, this uh, orangutan. Yeah. So maybe by changing certain uh, regulation and uh, bring that up to the local uh, tours, it should kind of still be a sort of uh, uh, good way to go to see the wild animals. So you go in their natural habitat, you go for a hike, uh, don't feed them, mm -hmm. and maybe you see, maybe you but, don't. But you have these orangutans that every single day will come out of the canopies and will go and chase the guides and will chase the tourists and they will, can only be placated by giving them food so what so what do you do uh, so they, this yeah. situation has been created artificially yeah. and now if the orangutans aren't fed they will attack people yeah so well, really the only way the only thing that you can do is move the problem orangutans where where are uh, the, what what's happening now now it's two months that those orangutan probably don't get fed by tourists. Uh, that's a good point. That's a good point. I, I have I have no idea. Maybe maybe a transition time, six they'll months. Be, they'll be foraging like 
they'll be foraging like wild orangutans should do. But as soon as the tourists start coming back, they'll do exactly the same thing because it's an easy meal for them. And the tourists get a thrill out of that. Mm. Yeah. It's the same thing in diving, you know, with the, with the macro stuff. Um, you know, people, the photographers, they want a picture of a, a certain animal doing a certain thing. And the guides have been like that. pressured yep. into it for so long that they, they do it. Um, it's the same thing yep. with with Book and Luang. The guides yeah. are just wanting to make their customers they want to get happy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the tourists go and they demand it. Yeah. So actually, really, we're the ones to blame, and the guides, of course, are going to do Always. what they can to to make some extra money. Yeah. yeah, exactly. If there was no demand for it, they wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. The one that you were mentioning earlier, the, the, the rehab center with the, the mother boxer and the baby with the picture there, where exactly is that? Is that in uh, Indonesia or is it in Middle Asia? Yeah, it's in Indonesian Borneo in Kalimantan. The BOS Foundation, again, I cannot recommend these guys enough. They're just doing amazing work for orangutans. Is that down in the south near, um, uh, what's it called, uh, uh, Puti... Uh, Bukit Bo Lawan. No, not no. Bukit Lawan. Uh, Tanjung Putih. Tanjung Putih, yeah. Puting. Yeah. Tanjung Putih yeah, yeah. down there. Yeah, really menting. Okay. Excellent. Gotcha. Yeah. And those guys, they need funds too. Because, you know, people tend uh, like maybe they give once, but they need, the, like you, you said before, uh, they need the regular funds to come in because uh, they get busy and they have more orangutan coming in. And uh, it costs yeah. cost lots of money too huge to, amounts of money to, to provide to rehabilitate these animals yeah and to give them enough space so this pro this project that you guys are working on with the orangutans is that going to be a a, a full hour-long documentary or a feature yeah. or in conjunction yeah, with writing yeah 52 minute documentary um looking at this project raise the red flag and looking at the um and looking at uh, orangutan tourism uh, and then we will look for um, we're working with um, Louis Theroux um, the filmmaker who's who's shown an interest in the project and then hopefully we'll get a big broadcaster on board or we will distribute the film ourselves that's certainly the plan what kind of timeline are you hoping I mean do you have quite a bit more to film or um, do you have a timeline yeah, already um it's in the kind of final, final-ish stages of edit. I would certainly hope we'll have something within the next month ready oh. to start touting around. Um, as part of the film, we also uh, interviewed an orangutan trader, and this was meant to be our big ending. Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to say too much. Um, but rescuing some baby orangutans from these from these traders, um, and speaking to these traders about how the animals are actually got from the wild and then sent to these wildlife tourism attractions. You wouldn't believe some of the, some of the things that we heard about how the animals are caught you know, and the trees are a bit cut down and then the mothers are bludgeoned to death and then the babies are taken from their dying arms. Animals being uh, taken and then shaved and then sent to be prostitutes. Yeah. So orangutan prostitutes. I heard that too. In, uh, it's quite a yeah. thing in... Uh in some places in Asia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to actually hear it from a former trader was mm -hmm. you, you, just the depths that we will sing yeah. to. to... Mm -hmm. There was a, actually, there was a local channel mm -hmm. here in Indonesia that they, they, because he made it to the news uh, of in, locally here in Indonesia that there was this uh, basically a hut where they had an orangutan prostitute and uh, they went in yeah, with pony. the police to do a bust. And yeah, yeah, P Pony the orangutan. And she was taught to do this sexy dance when she would see men. So even after they rescued her and the male handlers would come to feed her or whatever, she would approach them and do this kind of dance because that's what she'd been trained or conditioned to do. Wow, scary. And where would she be now? I mean, I'd imagine She's one a, like that where she cannot go back to the wild. Uh, she was a, with B, uh, BOS Foundation as well. Okay. Uh, and I, they, I think she's in a, um, she was released into semi-wild habitat. Oh, that's great. So again, uh, a, a good story. But All what right. she's endured, just horrendous. And we deserve uh, COVID. We deserve COVID-19 and a lot worse. Yeah. 
what because uh, these these animals they live up to about 50 years or longer no yeah yeah that's right 50 and, 60 years I think. yeah and well, i was doing a little bit of research on them recently and there's actually three they always thought that there was two species but there's a third species so they've got the yeah. the, the borneo ones the north sumatra ones and then the southern central uh, sumatra ones. really yeah yeah yeah, the third, third species of orangutan, small, small population, but yeah, that's uh, another another species. That's pretty amazing that we're going to have such a mega fauna, a charismatic mega fauna like this that we've known about for so long, and and only just in the recent years figured out that there are actually three species, not two. Hmm. Yeah, I guess because the differences are very subtle. Right. So the naked eye. Um, it's like with the underwater world, you're constantly discovering new with manta rays. They think that there's, there's a third species, right? right? That Andrea Marshall has identified, but it, it takes an expert with decades of experience mm -hmm. to actually notice the subtle differences. And I'm not sure exactly how that, um, how it became identified, the third species of orangutan. Um, but it, uh, I'm sure it was the, a lot of work went into doing that. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's interesting because that southern Sumatra one is actually closer DNA to the Borneo one than it is to the northern Sumatra one. Which oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, kind yeah, of, of an expert. Because they were, you know, with the land bridge back in the time, and so they came mm -hmm. from there mm -hmm. rather than from there. Wow. Good. And we are showing here one uh, of these uh, last oh, images in the male. set uh, with a big male uh, in black and white. Uh, incredible photo yep. can you tell us about this one thanks yeah i just wanted to end on a another kind of happy-ish note this was the large male called romeo romeo was another um orangutan got from a, a wildlife tourism venue in taiwan uh and romeo now lives uh again in a, in a semi-wild location they're trying to rehabilitate him it's unlikely that he'll ever be released back into the wild um because he certainly, when we, he was a, he was a lazy bugger. He just kind of <laughs> sat in his little. He'd made a, a, a burrow, and he just kind of sat in there and you know waited for for food to be delivered to him. He didn't look like he wanted to do any foraging, and I think he'd been kept too long in the wildlife tourism industry. But at least now he has a, he has a pretty nice life at, at BOS Foundation in Nyarimenteng. Um so yeah that was just i just wanted to to kind of end on a on a good note um something a little bit different most mm -hmm. of my images are, are often pretty brutal and show and this guy looks happy he does yeah very pensive just looking out into into the distance yeah, yeah. um beautiful so yeah thank you very much thank you it's uh, a pretty sobering look at uh you know a side of yeah things that pe not a lot of people are aware of shocking and someone like you that can actually you know again obviously you you do get emotional about it but that you can go into such situations and document it um you know that's on another level it's not easy for for people that you know like most people they they have pets they have dogs they have cats um, not easy for people to see that sort of thing and so for you to be able to travel across the world often putting yourself in dangerous situations mm -hmm. to document this this that's uh, you know that's another level of of journalism that's that's, that's tough it going is. yeah it's yeah it's um it's a lot of the time people will kind of look at it and i have people contact me and say oh you have the dream life i wish i could do what you do and it must be so amazing. I'm like, it's fucking hard, man. Like, mm. it's really, really difficult. And I, I've broken myself doing this job. And I'm currently having one of those sort of moments of like, can I do this anymore? Um, can I really keep putting myself in these situations? Because it's it's the mental turmoil um, and the physical stress of the constant traveling and the and the staying in grotty places, exposing yourself to bugs and diseases. You know, in the last, mm. I've, I've caught all kinds of crazy diseases and parasites. And, you know, I'm just recovering from pneumonia. Now my body's just saying, look, you need to Take have a, a rest. Yeah. So I'm currently harboring thoughts of starting a pottery. I want to start <laughs> a pottery on a Orchids. And just, just have a little, just have a little break. I'm a, 
like when I do things, I do it like a thousand percent. Right. So that's what I've done with this mm-hmm. job. It's like you throw yourself in and you do job after job after job and you immerse yourself in it. And yeah. there's only so much suffering that a person can can take. Can take, yeah. Absolutely. So we should, we, and uh, as uh, you look different, you know, Aaron, uh, when uh, you were here on the podcast before this tour you had, uh, you had a little bit more meat on you like that. And uh, we can really tell that we know you, that yeah. uh, you are exhausted uh, by this. So you need to take yeah. a nice yeah, rest I'm... now. And uh, and on top of it, we are stuck at home. <laughs> so <laughs> like we cannot even yeah. like meet and go to places to cheer you up. I know, I know. It's just been, it's been a shittiest time ever. Uh, and yeah, being stuck in dealing with all the coronavirus problems mm. as well as problems about what to do with one's life and, and ang- inner angst and existential crisis and uh, all of these other, Tough. all of these other problems. So uh, hopefully things will get back to, to normal soon. Yeah. Uh, I'm already looking at the next jobs. Um, it's been hard to kind of plan stuff while, while right. still recovering and uh, thinking of what to do yeah. with one's life. Um, but there are other jobs in the pipeline that will be similarly brutal. Right. Okay. I can't get enough. Right. Yeah, this yeah. job's going to, this job's going to probably kill me, but at least I'll have, at least if I go down this way, I can say I was doing it, doing something I was passionate about. Um, so yeah, so yeah, we'll see what the rest of this year holds. Okay. See where they can get back out on the road again and mm. document more animal problems. Yeah. Yeah, and keep us updated about what's going on with the orangutan feature because yeah. that'll be, I think, a lot of people would be interested in that. Absolutely. Yes. And, we'll and as soon as sure. uh, we reopen, uh, we're gonna take you out uh, to some uh, more. <laughs> Picking daisies. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll take you out to a field somewhere and sit yeah. 10 feet away from each other. We're going to take you diving oh, like, and have a good dive. Yeah. A bit of meditation. We could do some group meditation or something <laughs> Something that's good to make pot together. That would be nice. There yes. you go. Let's go I diving. I can see that. It's better. Us guys, we can be like um, Demi Moore and Patrick Swayze. <laughs> Ghost. Yeah. What do you think? That could be, no. That's the whole new podcast. No, I haven't watched it. Sorry. Let's just go diving. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Don't take it to the next level, please. <laughs> All right. All right, man. Hey, well, thank you guys for giving me the platform as always. Yes. Thank you just, for sorry, coming back. Just before oh. we we cut this out, actually, you mentioned it a couple of times. And uh, why don't you just briefly explain about the platform uh, Red F- Rising the Red Flag again? Yeah. Because uh, yeah. many of the our viewers didn't watch the podcast yet. Yeah. So that was um, so if you go onto Born Free's website um, and then um, it was advertised on their homepage uh, and if you see any cruelty happening when you visit any wildlife tourism attractions, see an, any animals being mistreated, animals being kept in terrible conditions, you can uh, go on to raise the red flag, you can make a report, and then we can hopefully go further down the line and, and investigate it. Excellent. Uh, thanks a lot. We place a link in the description yep. so that people can go and access that platform directly. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks so much for joining this interview. Thank you. And hope to see you soon. Thank you, Cheers. All right, guys. And that was Aaron Jakowski. And uh, that was a different show than the normal show that we bring to your attention. But we felt also compelled that uh, it's important to 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 show these sort of uh, things. You it's know? a pretty and, serious issue out there. I mean, it's a lot more widespread than people think it is. Uh, I mean... We've been, we, we spoke to Nesha, who was watching earlier, and she worked in a place up in, in Sulawesi where Correct. she also spoke to us about how they were always rescuing baby orangutans yep. from different places. It, it's a pretty widespread, and it, not just here, but all over the world, um, all over the world. illegal wildlife trade. And you just think of circuses, yep. think of zoos, think of marine, you know, um, blackfish and, and, and Orcas in, and if we don't talk about like uh, we don't change that trend exactly. so it's important for us like we are all divers out there so we love nature and uh, we like to have nature protected too 
so that's why it's important to actually expose that and uh thanks guys for the people that uh, watched the whole show probably there was a was, lot of uh, people that actually watched the yeah, whole show it was a some, hard one yeah but uh, you made it through and uh thanks and we did uh, we did blur out a couple of the images there sorry aaron yeah i know you didn't want us to but we did that we yeah. uh, if you want to see those images they are on his uh on not on his facebook page but his facebook um business page there, his photojournalism page, if you want to look more into the work that he's doing. And as I say, very important work. Uh, you can see more imagery uh, on his pages. We've listed them all Correct. in yeah. the description. And uh, let's do not forget, we already mentioned it also during the interview a few times and before when we started this show, like uh, bornfree.org.uk uh, website. So many of us that travel out there in the world soon we will be all traveling again hopefully you know finger sure. crossed and if you witness you know like it could be let's say a dolphin show you know like in a, in a swimming pool somewhere around the world like you can actually now uh, use that website uh, to point out uh, what you've seen and that's i think is a great tool for, for, for sure. all of us question yeah. you might be too young for this Born Free. Thanks. You know what Born Free is? Did you ever see that movie Born Free? I probably did, but uh, I don't really oh, remember. about some people that, that, that had lions. <laughs> you need to tell me the story. Lions. About it. It's all about lions. It's all about lions. I'm sure that's where the website Born Free, and maybe if, if Aaron is still watching, he can, he can answer that. But there was a, back in the 70s, it was, just, it was uh, about people that grew up with some lions and trying to release them back into, uh, into the wild. Into the wild, yeah. Because they were and, born free. Yeah. And talking of which, very, very interesting also what Aaron was saying, you know, like about this last image of beautiful Romeo orangutan too. It's like uh, once you take them out from there, it's very, very hard to reintroduce them. It sure is. Into, into nature, like, and uh, again, also like maybe changing their behavior, you know, like even probably if, if they stay, let's say, in the wild and you interact with them, you change them, let's say, less uh, than take them, taking right. them out but still you're gonna change that so it's uh, we really need to 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 sort of uh, reset our approach with uh wildlife uh, in a way let's just go there and be give let's say that minimum uh footprint in the wild and just watch them. yep because yeah. you think even locally here we we quite often see people with pet monkeys and these could these are the, the, the macaques that you get here in Bali and people will find young ones. They're so cute and they're young and they, they keep them as a pet. But once you've done that, mm. those monkeys can't go back to the wild. They can't go back. That's you it. can't just say, oh, this, this monkey has got two rambunctious mm -hmm. for me. I'm going to put it back with its family. You can't put it back with yeah. its family. They will reject it. It's hard it, so. out there to get yeah. food. It's yeah. a, you know, like well, you, the family will reject it. It, yeah. it can't go back. So yeah. uh, once you've done it, it's... It's for life. That's right. All right, guys. So we're going to go back into <laughs> like uh, a pretty a story interview. and swing uh, coming pretty, up on Wednesday. Pictures. Who are we going to have again, Michael? We Wednesday. are going to have Ethan and Lee. We're going to look at some pretty pictures of coral. Yep. Corals, snorkeling, Fish. the beautiful world of... Uh, a little bit different than ocean. what we had today. But yeah. nonetheless, as I say, today was a very important episode uh, to put that out there. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot again uh, to Aaron Jakowski and... Uh, for coming on the show for the second time we also made a podcast previously yeah. that you can also find on our youtube channel with him and that one we were talking more about the it's a very trendy thing on twitter these days is people you see people with otters wild otters that people yeah. are, are keeping in in cafes and things like that as well as the tigers from mm -hmm. thailand uh, those are the ones that we talked about with Aaron on our last podcast. Orangutan fighting in yeah, Thailand too. Exactly, yeah, the yeah, boxing yeah. orangutan. So, More like the show put up uh, for the, the entertainment circus. show yeah. for, for, for people. So if you're interested in seeing more from Aaron, check our YouTube. Maybe and we can make pop that, uh, that link into the description after we're finished here. Yeah. And you can see that the original podcast with Aaron as well. That's right. And also you can find that uh, by following Aaron by using the link that we placed in the description. All right, I think that's it for that's today, it. Monday. And uh, we're going to come back uh, again on Wednesday and Friday. So Wednesday, guys, uh, remember, is 8 a.m. 8 a.m. Bali time. Yeah. So we'll be live for North 8, America. 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific and mm -hmm. Europe. 
will most likely be asleep yeah. that time. But don't worry, guys, because we always do again a watch party if, if you are in a different time zone. Yeah. So like also for this show that we just uh, presented to you today, you might be actually now watching it on the watch party because we will do that uh, tomorrow morning, exactly. Bali time. All right. So which is right now if you're watching it Ooh. on the watch party. Look at that. Ooh. Quantum physics coming it's confusing. out. It's quantum, man. Like we're in both places in the same time, you know, by doing something like movie. that. Right. And guys, uh, last but not least, uh, don't forget to give a like uh, to this uh, show. And uh, if you think that there are some people out there that would be interested in watching this, please uh, also send it to them on a message, uh, something like that. They might appreciate uh, to actually uh, hear from Aaron Jakowski and his stories. That would be much appreciated. And if you're watching us on YouTube, guys, don't forget also to subscribe to the channel. That will help us uh, to come up with more and more interviews out there. And last but not least, if you would like to support the Underwater Tribe uh, uh, family here in uh, Bali during this difficult time, we place a few links in the description under the how to support the Underwater Tribe. And you can check those links out with you can give a small donation. Yep. All right, guys, uh, that's it for today. And uh, welcome back. We will see you soon. See you again. all on Wednesday. Wednesday. Bye-bye.